you very much. Um, let me quickly uh, introduce myself. I'm Mike Croucher. I'm Chief Architect at Travelport. But I've actually been in the industry, I usually say around 30 years, and added it up, it's getting closer to 40. So I'm feeling a bit like, like I've seen a lot of change over my time, whether that was originally building some of the original check-in systems and reservation systems back in the early 80s at Scandinavian Airlines, or through to the distribution days of the early days of the GDSs, and then followed on from that the online world and everything we are today. And uh, some of this I won't take you through that story, but some of it I want to tell you where we think the world's going. About five years ago, six years ago, my son was about to go to university and we started uh, looking into where the world was going for his uh, you know, application. And we started reading around the fourth industrial revolution before the World uh, Economic Forum and things hooked onto the fact there was a massive change happening in technology. And Jerry Rufkin's book and people like that way back looked at where that was going. So what I want to do now is start with a video that just puts that into perspective that we've seen the leaders of the world get together, what, four or five years ago in uh, Davos. Uh, and, and this was their opening video. There, there you see the, the end of that video, it says that the business models of each and every industry will change. And why? Because we're entering an era where access to technology is easier than ever before. And people can start up in garages around the world, you're going to see changes in where technology can be done as we enter that new world. And it opens up businesses to challenges and disruption. And what I really want to do is look at some of that. Everybody's saying if you look forward, is artificial intelligence going to mean there's going to be no jobs in the future? Well, they said that at the end of the third industrial revolution with computing. And they even thought that at the end of the second industrial revolution with automation. So what you're going to see is a change, and it'll change the way we think and the way industries re react around us. So how fast will that change happen? It's a big question. How quickly is the world going to pivot? Well, if you think change is getting faster, just think about this. This is the Easter parade in New York City, uh, Times Square, 1900. Uh, and the question is, can you spot the, uh, the car? It's horse and carriages, but there is a car there. It's somewhere up on the uh, left-hand side, right uh, halfway up. One, one automated vehicle, uh, car-driven vehicle, with the rest horse and carriages. Roll forward 13 years later, and you say, can you spot the horse and carriage? And if you think about the change that that brought around in society, what you needed to have that infrastructure in place, and what infrastructure you didn't need around people looking after horses, and think, I, I don't know what happened to the horses. Um, maybe a lot of people uh, are changing foods and things like that for a bit. But these, the, the whole marketing world changed, and society changed, and the infrastructure around it changed within 13 years. And then you just think what happened after that, because cars became something of a brand something you aspired to, an asset you wanted to buy. And we really felt differently about our cars. And you're probably all sitting there with a car, and you've probably all got it at home. And you, you buy a brand because you like it. And, and the marketing guys push these assets in travel. Can we have some? Car ownership meant status. I, I, I go, sorry, we'll go back. We get the, we get the sound up if I start that. 
time set up a relationship between car and driver. Car ownership meant status and freedom. But that relationship is about to end. Cars are divorcing their drivers. Oh my gosh, it's changing lanes on its own. I'm not touching it at all, and it's driving. Whoa, whoa. So we're seeing a real change already happening, and everybody's talking about AI, um, you know, self-drive vehicles and things like that. And I think everybody's going to think that cars are going to just drive themselves. I think I'll come to this later about artificial intelligence. I think where we are with arti artificial intelligence in the next few years is going to be assisted intelligence, not taking over things, but helping us in the way we do business. And I think that's what I want to talk about in travel, how artificial intelligence is going to help us in travel, not take over what we do. But the landscape around us is changing due to that. And I think what we're going to see is a real shift in the urban landscapes around us and the way people interact with cities and transportation around you. Now, what I'm going to show you next is... a. Uh, a, a, a bit of a, a video that's going to move from the intelligence of people in India going around their traffic to the modern landscapes of cities and, and, and where the world's going. So j just to finish this section, really looking at where cities are going into the future. Here you can see traffic's having problems, that so the human being's intelligent and can work their way around and create flow with human navigation. Now you put, start putting that into the ability of cars, and this is at traffic lights. We know traffic lights removed, but the cars actually interacting with each other to know where they are to avoid, and it creates flow. And therefore, with that flow, you're not gonna see the cities jam-packed with cars and, and traffic jams that we have today. And asset ownership will be removed. The next generation will not be buying their cars, they'll be renting them. And that would change the landscape, because your car today, is spending its time in a garage or on a car park. You use it 3% of the time. In this world, those assets are gonna be used all the time and it open up the landscapes. A lot greener and the connections of the cities, the buildings will connect to the traveling uh, environment around you. Cities like this are already being built around the world. But you're seeing even simple things where a pedestrian crossing here can spot an old lady doing it and signal to the driver of the car coming around the corner to slow down in advance. And what you see in there is what I'm calling that assisted AI. Not taking over, but it's giving you a warning and it's looking where things are going. So, I mean, that's the big picture of changing landscapes. But what's causing that is this world of digital that we all talk about and what is digital. And I'd like to bring digital to the flavor where I see it is in travel. What we have today is what I think is this digital spines emerging. You, you've all probably got a mobile phone, hopefully. Most people have. I know a few people that don't carry one. But if you are carrying a mobile phone, this is your, your connection into the Internet of Things. And if you think of where we are, the Internet of Things allows you to interact with the world around you. You can interact with billboards. You can interact with uh, queues in airports. You can interact with wayfinding. But you interact because you're not chipped. And actually, you use your mobile phone as your chip. Now, a few of us do know the guy that has got himself chipped. And, uh, and that's great. But I, I, I'm not going to go there yet. He's actually got one in his arm. And he's just recently put one in his brain. Uh, and he can control things with his brain that are remote uh, to him. Um, I, I don't think that's where to go just yet. But the Internet of Things with the mobile device allows you to interact with the world around you. If you then think about that, interacting without some form of intelligence doesn't work. So artificial intelligence on your mobile device allows you to do things you couldn't do before. The wayfinding, the next best action, what should you do? But artificial intelligence by itself isn't the answer. And what's really driving that is the access to big data. Artificial intelligence needs to be taught and it's taught by lots of data being given to it. So new industries are opening up. It, I, I was just watching a program recently in Kenya where um, in the slums there, they have people that are deep tagging pictures for artificial intelligence for wayfinding. In other words, they, they take a picture and they take every pixel on that picture and cover it and say, what is that? That's cloud, that's a sky, that's a car, that's a pedestrian. That, and by tagging it and feeding it into these artificial intelligence machines, 
we're able to do this type of thing. But a new industry is coming out of people tagging content. So we're seeing a real change happen around us. And then finally, why has this never been possible before? It's the speed at which we can do it, the speed at which we can teach the computer through big data, because we have an abundance of compute. We have the ability to access compute, whether that's in the cloud or in our own data centers, at a price point we've never seen before. So with that abundance of compute, with big data and artificial intelligence, you can drive this interaction with the world around you in a way we've never seen before. And that will change travel. And people are expecting that. And if we're not doing it as technologists, we're not bringing the traveling public with us on that journey. Somebody once said to me, well, Mike, why, what's so different between computer systems of today and, to, and yesterday? Well, we used to take computers, and we'd find something wrong with them, and we'd change that code, and we'd test it, and we'd load it, and six months later, something would change in that computer program. Now, that's happening in nanoseconds, as the data's feeding into the computer system that's learning itself. But it's only learning from the data that's being, that's being presented to it. Now, I, I just talked about the five big drivers, but if you go out there today and look at the fourth industrial revolution and the books coming out about business 4.0, so where is technology changing business to business 4.0, what you see is a whole wealth of next generation things that are happening. Now, the next generation things on the, on the, on the curve, forget about, for me, what is very interesting is the things in the middle there. What's happening to society around that? and the type of things as business leaders we need to think about in the next generation. Because I just pick a few of them out there, but this technology unemployment, is technology gonna drive unemployment, or is it gonna change the way we have to think about the type of people we need in our business going forward? A different creative mindset, not doing processes. We used to value people that could manage a process. Now we need to uh, value people with creative ideas and an agile mindset. We're going to have five generations of workers in the workplace because people aren't going to retire and we've got Generation Z coming through and we've got people like me that's going to need a Zimmer frame soon to go to work. So what you're going to see is businesses need to think about that full generation and in travel we need to think about it because we're going to have very different travelers right at one end of the scale that we're used to but this new generation coming through I'm going to talk about in a minute, Generation Z, how do they think? because we're designing travel for ourselves, we're not uh, designing it for that generation. So real change of things that's happening in the society around us. As I said, let's take a quick look at the customer of tomorrow. Uh, generation Z, uh, what are these? Uh, uh, y uh, they're youngsters, they, they, they spread from the millennium down, but what are they doing is very different to the way we book travel. I, I book travel, I think next Easter, um, wouldn't be nice to go to Rome. And I schedule out a weekend in Rome, and I start looking, and I start booking. And that's the way I think. But that's not the way they think. They've got a friend who's got an e Airbnb this weekend in uh, Rome, and they see it on Instagram, and they think, this is nice. They click on the picture, think, oh, I go there, and they book the flight. So they look very differently at travel. They look at this thing called validation. They want to do something where their friends validate that that's a good thing for them to do. They want the likes. They want to post it. It's the reason why we're not seeing 1830 holidays are disappearing from, you know, because actually what they're looking for is a very different immersive experience. We're also seeing that they want recommendations. They look for travel in a different way. They want their friends to recommend it. They want their social crowd to recommend it. And actually they want experiences. They want very unique in-destination experiences. So just, just looking at some of that going forward. On the experience side, in destination experience is where they're spending their money. They're spending 25% of their money on the journey, but they're heavily spending it in destination. But what they want is that unique experience. They don't want to do the natural tourist thing, taking the picture of the old building. They want to immerse themselves in the culture they're there. And I'll show you a video in a minute that, that's talking about that. What they're also doing is doing bookings really up close up to the last minute. Very different to the planner of today like me. They're a lot more uh, spontaneous. So if you're gonna sell to them, you need to be in the channel where they are. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So the way they're consuming travel is so different from the way we think today. Let me just uh, show you this. This is a couple years old now from Airbnb, but I, I, I still think it captures um, what 
the experienced world is turning to from the travel we used to do when I, when I used to travel. We've been doing a lot of reflecting, you know, reflecting about what it means to travel. These posters promised travel that was an easy escape to magical worlds. But this is the reality. You're lying, you're an outsider, you're often doing things locals never do. For many people, travel is easy, but it's not magical. And if you want to have an amazing trip, you can literally spend as much time planning your trip as on your trip. And so we want to fix this. We think travel can be magical and easy. Homes, experiences, and places together, all in one place. Welcome to the world of trips. We have immersions, which are multi-day handcrafted experiences that allow you to immerse in the local community. And we have single experiences, which are just a few hours. Oh, what's this? Want to hang out with other travelers? There's a meetup happening at Tin Roof Cafe. Are you interested? There's more. All this comes together in a single app. And if you have a passion, if you have an interest, or if you have a hobby, you can share your community with others in the world. Because you see, travel has never really been about where you go, but it's about who you can become. So, so there we've looked at the, the, the need for that experience of the travel of tomorrow. But they also want that validation. They want to put up on Instagram a picture that everybody says, wow. And if you go around these sites today, you see actually they're bringing nearly professional photographers with them to take unusual pictures. Because they want to show their friends that they've done something different. So the ability to validate what they've done. 75% of material now out there on Instagram is travel related. Now, if you think about that, that's big. Because people are posting their experiences. People are posting where they've been. And they're, they're stimulating demand, yet we're not satisfying that demand from within those social channels today. And I think we've got to think about that. I like this stat, 65% wouldn't know where their families were if it wasn't for Facebook. Um, that's, that's probably true as well. So, so looking forward at that, um, the look to book idea. Th this EasyJet released this. We, we've been working with EasyJet doing their mobile apps for uh, many years. Over the last year, we've been talking about integration into social media channels. And here you see, very, very quickly done, the ability to click on a picture in Instagram, move it into uh, the EasyJet app, use re uh, picture recognition to decide where that is in the world, and then say, from that point, we can get you there. So you're starting to build the ability to use artificial intelligence, use picture recognition, to start that booking journey from a very different place to where you're used to starting your booking journey. Because why should you come out of the channel you're in only to go to a website to click on Google to get the same three answers at the top of Google because somebody's paying a lot for AdWords? So the way people want to consume travel in the future is going to change. But just, just think of all these social media platforms and the way they work and the way people are looking for recommendations in this new world. Because all the social media is all around sharing. It's around the dreaming and it's around the planning, but very little is actually in the book space. One of the few that's actually getting heavily there with in-destination experience, recommendation engines, validation, and booking is probably TripAdvisor at the moment, who's beginning to think about how you pull those together. And I think our job as an industry is to think about how we pull those things together going forward. So if you just pick up the TripAdvisor. Uh, I love one. planning travel with the new TripAdvisor. and getting great advice and ideas in my personal travel feed. I can follow my friends and travel experts for recommendations that match my interests. Hey, check this out. So I can discover exactly what's right for me, like the perfect barbecue joint. Yeah, we have that barbecue. Great, I'll save it. The travel feed makes it easy to save ideas and plan trips together. got to see a show, though. Definitely. Yeah? No matter what your interests are, your travel feed keeps you inspired. 
Oh my god, we have to stay here. Like a review of a great hotel from your friend Debbie. And because you're on TripAdvisor, you can plan and book all in one place. Yeah, that looks great. So I think, I think what I wanted to show you during that sequence is people are beginning to see how do you join that social media, different channels of engagement, different ways of interacting with the customer, bringing recommendation and validation together with the booking process. And if you think about it, like I said, the keys that are driving that is this digital infrastructure. So now we go a bit onto the technology. So how are people thinking in this new world about or how should you be thinking as we enter this world of business 4.0? How should you look at technology? This, this infrastructure is very key. Place that infrastructure means you've got a very different base platform from the way we used to think about building systems. And we used to think about building systems as large systems of record, whether that was the GDS, the reservation systems, the SAPs of the world, the oracles of the world, large computer systems with systems of record. What they did was expose processing. So, so actually, you had a record. You need to transform it to another record. And you put some processing across the top of it. And then you expose that processing to the customer. And you said to the customer, you better understand my processing to do the job you want to do, whether that's booking a holiday, whether that's entering a financial journal. But it exposed it. And people became experts in the process of using systems of record. Now, looking forward, you know, why do we have so many travel agents in the world? Because actually, they needed to interact with those systems of records to actually do the bookings because it is difficult to do. But what you're seeing is actually this moving to actually systems of intelligence. And the winners at the moment are people that are building on top of those with new ways of connecting supply and demand. And if you think about Uber, and everybody talks about Uber as a digital transformation company, but what it really did was find out a way of connecting a supplier with a demand intelligently. And through that, able to link the, the, those two things in a very different way. And of course, they've done that, as you know, with, with taxes, but they're now doing it with food, and they're going to do it with you know, helicopter trips. And you know, They're thinking, how do I simply connect supply and demand using that intelligence layer? So, so they're using all the new technologies like complex event-based monitoring, uh, artificial intelligence, blockchain for distributed ledgers, to really pull these things together in a very different way. So these, these systems of intelligence are really going to start saying, where do you consume travel in the future? When I started, and, and some of you in the room may remember, we had uh, ATOs and CTOs, uh, airline ticket offices and city ticket offices. You just had to go to the airline to book your travel. And we invented systems that allowed airlines to interchange, whether it be BSPs and interlining and all those things, to exchange ticketing, you know, plated carrier, non-plated carrier. And we then extended the networks from the airlines to travel agencies. So each country had the airline systems and extended it to the travel agencies in their country. And then towards the end of the 80s, we formed the GDSs to actually push that wider and give wider distribution around the world. At the same time, actually hook the travel agencies to a wider content base. Then the web came along around the 2000s, and you saw the low-cost airlines selling direct. You saw the ability to the OTAs, the online travel agencies, to start to think differently about that. And the meta searches came in and really drove up the volume. When I started at Travelport four years ago, this time around, we were doing one and a half billion searches a month. We were pricing about six billion itineraries a day. We're now doing 11 billion searches a month. Yet we're not seeing the bookings in the world heavily rise to that length. What we're seeing is a consumer base that consumes travel and looks to travel in a very different way to the way it did it before. Um, but actually, the reason is access to travel is going to go through so many different channels. And who is going to be the winner in that new world? I think we need to really look at where the social media channels are. In the Twitters, in, in the Snapchats, in the Instagrams, where are the younger generation going to consume travel? And then if you look at the corporate side of travel, why do I have to go to my you know, phone up a person in a call center to book corporate travel. Why can't I book it with my meeting in office? So we've done uh, innovation where you can go into office, book your meeting, it understands who you are, who the other people in the, the meeting are, and sends them the ideal itinerary for them to arrive at that, and you can book in an office uh, as part of that. Book into Salesforce, 
I'm going to a regular meeting with the same customer that I do regularly. Why isn't that part of just the, the booking process in Salesforce? And I think over these next two days out there, you'll see many tech companies doing many of these things. How do I integrate bookings into my channel? How do I give individual experiences to people? How do I make that come alive? A very different way of looking at travel and technology going forward. I just want to quickly cover the artificial intelligence. I, I normally talk about quite a few technologies, but with the constraint of time, I thought I'd just do artificial intelligence rather than blockchain. Blockchain, by the way, is a hype. It's really good, it's gonna be important, but it's no more than a database, it's about how you use it. So just really don't get too concerned about blockchain. Just understand the, the, the type of use cases you can find. But let's take artificial intelligence because I think we're on the cusp. We're just starting the world of artificial intelligence. Um, look, the hype, it's never, there's never gonna be a robotic human for a very long time. There's not enough compute power and it doesn't have the power base that, that a human brain has. It doesn't have that type of um, inspirational jump that allows a human to jump from A to B without the logic, because it needs logic. On the other hand, the things that the reality is speech recognition. You know, in 2017, the computer's speech recognition was better than you and me. What does that mean? A computer would have understood a lot I said today. You've cut out words and you've struggled to understand me a bit. So a computer speech recognition in 2017 was human parity and above. By 2018, it passed the comprehension test from Stanford University. Uh, if anybody wants to take it, it's 1,000, uh, 100,000 journals, you read them, and then they ask you comprehension tests about it. Not facts, but joining of facts. How do you interpret what's there? Uh, and, and, if, uh, and the computers pass that. By 2018, translation in five major languages were around the world better than the human being with its speech recognition. So that, that use of AI is really driving up, but it doesn't have self-awareness. Um, therefore, I think, and many of the big companies I work with, Microsoft, IBM, play, people like that, I talk about this moral code of conduct that you're gonna need around artificial intelligence. Because actually, it will build in bias if there isn't human intervention. Because it'll learn about bias. So we need human intervention. We need to actually understand that artificial intelligence needs a moral code of conduct to understand how you use it, when to use it, and how to intercept it by human interaction. Uh, and, and the big companies are looking at that. In travel, you're seeing it used um, many ways. You're seeing it already for wayfinding, personalization, taking the costs out your call center with chat box, intelligently distribution data around the world so you can create speed by putting the data you need and the transactions you need at the edge of the cloud uh, quickly. Giving you ideas like best time to buy, uh, Hopper in America, now, uh, for a long time now, you can sign up and say, when's the best time to buy this flight? And it will tell you based on predictive analytics, don't buy now, hold. Those type of companies are gonna come into Europe more and more, and I know Hopper's just got a $100 million release of funds to actually uh, approach uh, Europe as well. And, and these are reverse engineering, the revenue management systems of airlines to tell the customer, don't buy now, there's gonna be a dip in price. A very different way of looking at um, the, uh, buying travel. So we talked about, therefore, systems of record and systems of intelligence. And then on top of that, the systems of engagement. And this is where I've been talking about where will you go to get your travel? Where, whereabouts in the world will you think about getting travel? And that's going to happen in these systems of engagement. And who knows what they are? Who knows whether e which one of these is going to actually be successful? But the key is, from a technology point of view, to make your technology such that it, it can be consumed easily into any of those channels. So what we've always done is make sure our APIs are consumable in all of these channels. So no matter what channel comes along, you can build it in very quickly and very easily. So just outside here, you see one of our innovation stands. We've got the virtual reality where you can go, you know, it's a proof of concept, you can go around the world, find a place, go in there, see a beach in Perth, see a hotel, and book it within virtual reality. Um, but the real point is, you're making travel accessible wherever the consumer wants to be going forward. So for me, a lot of it's been around innovating, and, and the big players, the big tech players, are innovating and putting millions of dollars into this. Uh, whether it's Microsoft, TCS, Tata Group, and IBM. Um, we've worked very heavily with IBM looking at uh, where blockchain's going. How do we use their Watson analytics on corporate buying of travel? different ways of exploiting this into travel. 
And I think the travel industry has been a bit behind some of the retailers and other industries in exploiting this technology. And I think the pivot's happening now. And as an industry, we need to catch up with it. Um, in, in, in the engagement space, we've been looking at the virtual reality, the integration into chat box. You'll see some of the uh, augmented reality out there. And I'll show you a video in a minute of some of that type of stuff that, that's going on. And then really, the hard digital infrastructure is what the techies do. How do we expose this in very cheap and light ways through things like MongoDB? Um, I talked about a blockchain wallet, but just think about uh, your data. We, we're all in the world of data, GDPR, uh, data privacy. I, I, I wonder what you do with your money. How many of you put your money in a bank? Most of you. Why? Why don't you take your money and go to every supplier you may ever want to do business with and say, here, here's some of my money in case I want to spend it with you. But you do that with your data. And you put your data out to all these people and say, I'm going to store my data with you in case I ever need to talk to you again. And they love it. They've got all this value of data out there and you give it to them. So we believe long term, you're going to have data banks and companies are already working on this. Some of the big banks, some other people about, I'm going to store centrally data. And I could store it maybe on a blockchain. And I could give an encrypted uh, key to an individual that says, here, you can access my data off this blockchain for a certain amount of time, and then it expires. And that starts meaning the customer takes back control of their data. I think that's going to be critical as we look forward, because that spread of data and how you control it in the new world is going to be very, very important. So just, just moving on, let, let's inspiring travel. So th these technologies, how are they inspiring travel in a very different way? around you and just for fun our team's been playing with an idea of adding a helpful guide <laughs> like that there HoloLens launch experiences. It's a travel experience that makes you feel like you've been transported to a place and feel like you're really there. My favorite moment in Rome is when you travel back in time in the Colosseum and watch a gladiator fight from the perspective of the emperor. That's a really cool way to connect with history that you can't even get even when you're there. Yeah, thanks. I like, I like the Google map invention and the idea of that little fox. Um, unfortunately, I don't think they ever released it, and I think they should have done I don't know how many of you have got that little blue thing, and you do like that, and you start walking, you find you've walked 100 yards in the wrong direction, because you never quite work out where you're going. Uh, but that, that type of overlay of augmented reality into virtual reality into your real world is the way people are going to consume travel going forward. But I think our biggest problem as an industry, despite all this, is really we've actually come at it always from that angle that we're going to work out how people want to consume travel. And we're going to give our processes to them, and we're going to silo it, because we're all going to own the customer, and we're not going to share the customer on the journey. The customer buys an experience from me, buys a hotel from me, buys a, a, an air trip, but we don't combine it. What the customer is is on a trip. They're on a journey and an experience, and they want that journey and experience combined into a trip. But actually, the way we've designed many of these things is siloed. And each part of that, that, that travel experience is still too siloed and not joined up. And I think as an industry, we, we need to think about how do we think differently going forward and really go back to saying in that journey experience, we need to put the traveler at the center of it and design from the traveler out. And I think if everything we do in this industry going forward goes of how does somebody want to consume travel, what do they want to experience on their travel? And then build the trip around that, rather than what we've traditionally done is build the trip and then try to sell them that that's a good idea. Start with the customer, start with the experience. 
I, I think it's wonderful out there over the next couple of days that you, there's the world to experience out there, but how do we take that to the public? How do you give people that ability to be inspired by a different way of consuming travel going forward? So I'd just like to finish by really saying, I think the fourth industrial revolution will transform our industry as much as it's transforming any else. I think through the mobile, through the internet of things, we can interact with the world. And we have that data and analytics and artificial intelligence that really underpinning this would drive it. The cloud technologies means anybody can get into this world. But I think fundamentally, we as an industry need to deliver that personalized, seamless experience. And if we keep on coming at it from that angle, how do we make the customer's journey seamless? How do we give them the experience we need? And how do we make it very personalized so they can, they, they can feel that they've been validated when they've been on that journey? That what they've seen is different to that mass tourist consumption they used to have. I think as an industry, there's, you know, this place is just growing. So thank you very much. Um, I hope you have a great conference. And uh, 